Hi everyone, my name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor and today I have a well-known and respected name when it comes to commodity investing, especially precious metals and uranium, Mr. Lobo Tigre from Independent Speculator. Lobo, welcome to my show. Well, thank you for inviting me. Should be an interesting conversation. I believe so. I personally follow your work for years now, but uh, for the ones that do not know you, uh, can you tell uh, us, uh, give give us a brief introduction of who is Lobo Tigre? How did you get involved in uh, commodity investing and, uh, and analysis? Well, the, the quick version is that in 2004, when Doug Casey and his then partner, David Galland, founded Casey Research, they were looking for an editor to help with the writing part, um, you know, they had geologists and mm -hmm. finance guys and so on that they were contracting with, and and they just knew me. Uh, you know, I got my job by being the black sheep of the family, hanging out with atheist anarchists like Doug Casey. Um, and then I just learned. You know, I, it, David Golan says I took to it like a fish to water, and and uh, you know, I I never studied geology. I I, I always like to stress that because people mistake me for a geologist all the time. And the truth is I've, I've never taken a course in geology unless you count 20 years in the field with world-class geologists, but you know, in school, I never did. That's um, better than college. 20 but, years. Yeah, no, I, but I've always been interested as a kid. I collect rocks, you know, <laughs> I traveled with rocks in my luggage before I worked for Casey research. <laughs> um, so, so I got paid to think about rocks and, and write about them and, and then to travel and, uh, and and hang out with people who really did understand and learn from them. So it was a wonderful thing. And then uh, after there was a change of ownership in Casey Research, um, I, let's just say I, I wasn't a very good fit with the new corporate structure after a while. So I became the independent speculator. And by the way, I asked Doug before I put this name on the company or on the you know, the main newsletter, because his newsletter for 30 plus years was the international speculator. Yeah. So okay. clearly this is a riff on Doug. And I asked him and he gave me his blessing. And, and well, now they folded up the international speculator. So I guess I'm the only IS standing now. So basically I, I, I learned from Doug and, and Rick Rule and others in this business who are very generous with their time and knowledge uh, and I and I went around kicking rocks on Doug's behalf for all those years, and now I'm trying to share what I've learned with my audience. Great. I would like to start with the due diligence questions, if you don't mind. Uh, first one would be, when investing in certain mining stocks, what kind of allocation would you suggest between explorers, developers, and actual producers uh, for an average investor? in terms of percentages. I, I understand. Um, that's not actually a due diligence question. Portfolio allocation has nothing to do with researching, but I get this question a lot and I think people are often surprised. Um, my, my answer is sort of Austrian. If you know the criticism of Austrian economics versus yeah. mainstream economics, you know they, they over-mathematize everything, everything and they, they imagine that with these big formulas that they can predict the human equation of the market. And it's not true, it's a fantasy. At best, you can approximate some aspect of things. And I just, I think that a great speculation is such a rare thing. You know, there's thousands and thousands of mining companies and stocks out there, and most of them are crap. Yeah. And the ones that, you know, are really a great speculation, there's so few and far between that I think that's more important than any kind of portfolio allocation metric. And there's no, there's no right answer. There's certainly no one size fits all. And if I came across, you know, a, a great silver stock, but I already had a bunch of silver stocks in my portfolio, I wouldn't say, no, no, I don't want any more silver because I'm, I'm overweight. So, so I think that a, a, a truly great speculation is such a rare thing that I don't want to turn one away for portfolio allocation reasons. But if I do find that I end up having way more silver in my portfolio than I really wanted, well, then I might take profits a little earlier. You know, I'm, I, I'll adjust the portfolio as I go yeah, so that it doesn't become all, you know, silver or whatever. You know, that, that's very unlikely. I mean, it, again, a great speculation is so rare that it's it, it just hasn't been a problem where I've ended up with really too much of one thing. I just I become aware that the portfolio is getting a little heavy here. 
what's more likely though is that my allocation will change because I become more or less bullish on something. When I first launched the independent speculator, I didn't have any uranium stocks, for example. It had really bottomed already, uh, like the whole commodity sector, really about five years ago, I guess a little bit before 2018. But I wasn't sure yet. There had been false dawns before. Yeah. So it wasn't until I saw not just that uranium prices were up, but a series, you know, it would correct and the lows would be higher, as our technicals friends like to say, a series of higher highs and higher lows. Yeah. And about mid-2018, I saw that really taking shape. And that's when I started to go long uranium. And that has done very well for me in the years since then. Um, and it's gotten to the point now where I've got way more uranium in my portfolio than I ever thought I would. Same and, and, and But still... You know, I'm, I'm looking at where we're at right now in 2023 and, you know, the sort of promised land that uranium bugs have been waiting for for so long seems to never arrive. But actually, it seems to be arriving now. In my view, the most important variable is the long term contracting. Right. The, the spot can be jerked around by, you know, the Japanese selling after Fukushima or whatever. But what's really going to move this market is when the end users, the utilities have to sit down with the miners and say, okay, what will it cost us to get uranium supply secure for the next five years? And the miners just aren't going to do that at these prices. So we're seeing this now. And so the last stock I bought that I added to my portfolio was another uranium stock. Right? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's like I don't, a, I don't want to say no to a great opportunity and yeah. B, it's something that I see happening now. So even though by weight, I'm I'm now far more into uranium than I thought I would be. It's still not like half my portfolio or something, but it's a lot. It's, it's, I think it's more than a third. Um, so that, that's, that's the way I manage it. I, I really, I go where the very best opportunity I can find is. And if by some strange chance that happened to get me like exceedingly overweight in some area, then I would look to take profits early or correct that. But that's never happened. In all the years I've been doing this, I've never ended up like so lopsided that it felt urgent to sell something, whether I wanted to or not. Yeah, yeah got it. And uh, what attributes uh, you like to see in managements that run the mining projects before you take them seriously and ultimately invest your money? Well, ideally, I, I like Rick Rule's dictum of I want to find a team that has been successful doing the same thing in the same geology or mm -hmm. geography before. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, a, a lithium miner from the Atacama who decides he wants to be a high grade gold vein miner in Canada. That's not highly transferable experience other than just sort of general mining knowledge. Um, and you know, high grade gold mining in Canada is not the same as Carlin style disseminated gold in Nevada. So ideally you want somebody who's done that before. And, you know, there are new people coming into the industry, but there's enough gray beards here that, yeah. you know, there are people like that out there. And I, I've stressed ideally several times because, you know, there is no perfect speculation. You know, my definition of a great speculation includes, uh, not just potential for extraordinary gains, but reasonable odds, that combination of not feeling like I'm just throwing darts at the board with my eyes closed, but that I actually have a good chance of winning plus winning big. That's what makes a great speculation. Nothing's perfect. And the ideal circumstance of this highly transferable knowledge from you know doing the same thing twice, it's just not very common. If, if that were my sole criteria, I probably would have five stocks in my portfolio right now, you know, maybe six, seven. Yeah. I, with all due respect to my friend Rick Rule, I don't think he'd have as many as he has either. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. you know, that's what we we'd like to find. That's what we look for. But as close as we can get to that, that's fine. Okay, so you know, maybe it's high grade veins in Peru instead of high grade veins in Chile. Oh, that's closer, right? I'm I'm willing to go there. Okay. Uh... My next question uh, is when you analyze the mining project, how do you assess whether certain projects will actually be built? Uh, what criteria are you paying attention on? 
the reason why I'm asking this is uh, some managers, uh, managements never intend to build uh, that project, uh, rather just monetize it. So how do you recognize that? Well, the simplest answer would be actually not grade is king, but margin is king. <laughs> okay. It has to be big enough to matter. And, and when I started doing this 20 years ago, half a million ounces plus was considered big enough to matter. But these days, if it's not at least a million ounces with district scale potential, you know, forget yeah. about it. Okay. But, a, you know, a, a million ounce mine at a reasonable production rate, say 100,000 ounces a year, 100,000 ounces a year, is that's that's not just junior level. That's significant gold production. Mm -hmm. It's accretive even to mid-tiers. Maybe not a major wouldn't buy that, um, but another gold company might if the if the margin was there. So so margin really is king more than anything else. Now there's a lot that goes into guesstimating that in the earlier stage, you know, in in development and exploration, and, you know, yeah. greenfields. The more difficult that estimation gets. But the more data you have that gives you confidence of high margin, the better. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's not necessary for the mind to ever be built to make money. If you are lucky enough to buy into something before a discovery, you can make a huge amount of money in that first spike in the Lasan curve, whether or not that even turns <laughs> turns into an economic deposit, let alone a mine. I agree right. on that. That can happen. Yeah. That's now that's hard. It it's very hard to get in before a discovery. Nobody knows when that's going to happen. Not even Doug and Rick, and certainly not me. Uh, so that's that's hard. But but there's also the the subsequent stage I call success in progress, where you've gone from that initial discovery to defining a deposit of significance, and that's fairly reliable. There's a free, if you don't mind my saying so, there's a free report at the website, or it's an article. Just look for a success in the search tool, and you'll find what I mean by success in progress. So, um, and you know what? There's times where you drill off a great deposit, it looks very exciting, and then the metallurgy scuttles it or political risk rears its head and the mine never gets built. But you still make a lot of money on an exciting discovery as that deposit's being defined. Um, you can also make money on, on one of my favorite areas of, of speculating, the pre-production sweet spot, another free report, uh, look for PPSS on the website, and and the beauty of that is like you that the pre-production sweet spot is when you go from spending money and you know dis discovering and making money exploiting, and there's a translation there uh, which obviously adds value, and you can see who's building the mine. There's no mystery about it, and and the best thing about it is, you know, what if the mine doesn't work? What if it's not as profitable as modeled and so on? You don't know that until after it's built. <laughs> so you get all this excitement of making this transition from spending money to making money. Yeah, yeah. And and you don't you don't get disproof until after the fact. So there's things like that. So ultimately, you know, I I'd like to feel that I'm contributing to the world and bringing resources to our civilization that needs these metals and so on. But I I, I wouldn't be too procrastinating about what I and actually. Frankly, this is a difference between Brent Cook and myself. People, I, I have a great deal of respect for Brent. Every time we meet at a conference, we sit down and compare notes. Where you've been lately? What rocks have yeah. you kicked? <laughs> and I, I would say this is maybe the biggest difference. Well, we have political differences, but that doesn't matter for stock yeah. picking. The biggest difference is he wants to believe that this is going to be a mine, or, mm -hmm. or it can be. Mm -hmm. And until he he comes into something that says, "Oh, this is never going to get built," then he's out. He's gone. I think he sometimes leaves money on the table doing that. And there have been times where it's just the story, you know, lithium is the flavor of the day or whatever. Uh, you can make a lot of money on a flavor of the day as long as you're agile enough to get out before it turns south. <laughs> Definitely. And Lobo, what are the top five red flags investors should be considering when doing a due, due diligence on uh, some junior companies? I'm I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that over the noise. I've just turned your volume up. Can you repeat the question? Uh, what are the top five red flags investors should be considering uh, when doing a due diligence on junior explorer? Yes, well, definitely. Play, <laughs> topic of the day would be political risk. As you and I are speaking, the news is just out about Namibia considering taking a mandatory unpaid stake in mining companies. Yeah. 
you know, if if that had been set out from the get go, right, that's just the way it was. And you accepted that when you went in and you only explored for projects that could bear that weight. That would be one thing. But to add it on top of existing concessions or existing production, we don't know how this is going to go or even if it's going to go. But that's a game changer for those people. If you've got a 5% margin and suddenly the government takes 15% of your company and okay, it's through equity. Anyway, I don't want to get too lost in that. I just want to say this sort of thing can be fatal for projects. And I know that some of my esteemed peers have said it doesn't matter what the color of the skin is of the person who robs you. And that's true. Um, but it's also true that some countries are riskier than others. And when there's a country that's clearly made mining unwelcome or is moving in that direction, that's a huge red flag. It takes a lot for me to get into, say, Bolivia or a place with a history of nationalization. Mm -hmm. It would take, you know, it's pretty much a no-go zone for me. To, mm -hmm. to even consider it would take an absolutely like once in a lifetime opportunity and a truly world-class discovery to make me even consider it. So <clears throat> political risk is, is one thing. The other thing is, and this sounds kind of boring and, and technical, but it's really not that difficult, but it's to dive into the company's financial statements and look at the ratio of GNA versus Exploration. exploration. If they're spending yeah. more money on their salaries and promotion than they are on drilling and you know going into the ground, that's a big red flag. Yeah. You know, lifestyle right. companies they'll put out you know press release after press release of exciting sounding stuff, but never really adding value. You know, agreed. And we picked up this new property. We expanded the property. We expanded it again. You know, <laughs> you know that doesn't add value for shareholders. And not until they, they def, you know, do the hard work of discovering, defining, and proving up something of, of real net present value. So, uh, the, the, you know, the, the way I look at it is, you know, you're sort of a, a, a criminal investigator, and, and this is forensic analysis, forensic accounting. And, you know, you can talk to the guy or the gal at the mining show, and they'll give you the best possible story. But the filings with the regulators, they have to tell the truth or they face huge consequences and of yeah. course i mean you can lie anywhere i suppose if they lie there you know you're dealing with some real bad actors but most people won't do that most people who will who will tell you only the most positive news when you ask them in person they'll still tell the truth in the mdna and in the financials you can look into that so that's a huge red flag when i see that um another very important one is skin in the game Mm -hmm. When management Agreed. doesn't own any of the stock, uh, you know, <laughs> why should I put my money in if they won't put their own money in? And this does not include free options that they got for signing on as directors or something, but it means of course. cash cash that, yeah. of their own that they put in. Buying at the markets. And a few exceptions, especially for young geos who, who made it to the C-suite, I'll accept sweat equity. If the guy tells me, you know, well, I didn't have much money, but I... I, I took a dollar for my salary for three years. And I put my life into this project for the last three years. And I really believe it. that that would that would cut the mustard for, for me. But generally, you want to see some real skin in the game. There's no hard number on this. And the bigger the company, the smaller the fraction would tend to be. Of course. Of course. But if it's less than 5%, that's a red flag. I mean, if it's less than 1% or 2%, it's probably a non-starter for me. Um, but you want to see significant skin in the game. If you quick story, I've seen, well, I wasn't there, but I remember talking around the water cooler at Casey Research back in the day. And there's a famous story of Doug Casey, my mentor, sitting at a pitch for some junior mining company in Vancouver and getting up and walking out. <laughs> he just, just gets up and walks out. Uh, uh, Doug, what'd you do that for? Well, it says right here in the presentation, they don't have any skin in the game. They don't own any of the <laughs> stocks. So I'm not interested. He just, he just got up and walked out. <laughs> he was probably right. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, I wasn't there. So I can't tell you how the story ended, but uh, <laughs> very important. <laughs> that's great. That's a great story. Um, and then other other things you asked for five. I don't know. I have five. Those are, That's a good starting point, but just, you know, assume a very skeptical attitude and and watch for BS. 
when when somebody has a drill result and they say, oh, it's 100 meters of of five grams per ton gold equivalent. And that that's like that five grams of gold equivalent is 0.15 grams gold and it's 2% zinc and 3% lead. <laughs> you know, it's not a gold discovery. It's a lead zinc discovery. Um, so be skeptical. And when you see something like that, that clearly is a distorting reality, you know, that's a major red flag. Okay. Uh, one other question. Uh, when you consider in terms of timing, uh, what is the best entry point? When is the best entry point to acquire a stock? Is it the downside after some financing? Is it a broad sell off? Or you just look at the technicals? When is the best time to enter one stock? Well, I will answer, but the problem, excuse me, the problem with the best time is that one is rarely there. One is one rarely happens to be at the door when opportunity knocks and get in at the best time. And also, my experience is that very, very few people have the long-term mindset to really do this optimally. If you're mm -hmm. going to do the the Baron Rothschild's blood in the streets formula, you know that's objectively that's really the best time. You probably want to wait for 10 or 15 years for a major cyclical low. And then just at that point, you almost could throw darts at the dartboard, just buy the most hated sector when it was an absolute bloodbath and nobody wanted to hear about it. The bottom might be behind you or in front of you, you don't know. But if you're getting in so dirt cheap, it almost doesn't matter. And then you just wait to be right. Um, I think if I tried to sell a newsletter on that premise, I might have three readers yeah. because, you know, nobody's going to wait 15 years. <laughs> That's just yes. not the way the, the world works. But the, the honest answer is that would be the way to stack the odds most in your favor. We have that kind of very long term view. But, you know, mo I'm not even sure I could do that. You know, that's really difficult. And when you see something. So my, my, my answer is whatever the ideal timing might be, I want to look at the value proposition. I, I, I think of myself, this may sound like an oxymoron, but I think of myself as a value speculator. I'm not a gambler. I'm a disciplined investor that is willing to speculate, but based on value. I want to see a compelling value proposition. So there are times where I find an exciting story. It's, it's going gangbusters. Everybody's piling in. But the company doesn't even have a resource yet. And the market's already giving it a billion dollars in, in valuation and market cap. Um, you know, <laughs> you know for, for, the, for the company to define and prove off something that has that much net present value after you pay for the mining and everything, it's a huge hurdle. So uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm just not willing to go there. But if I look at something and, okay, let's say um, you know, gold at $2,000 plus or minus, it's not cheap. It would have been better if you could have bought it at the cyclical low in 2015. Um, <laughs> but that's then. We can't go back in time. And if I can find a stock that is still, you know, I look at it and the company has 100 million market valuation, and it looks like this deposit could easily be worth five times that. Well, that starts to be the ingredients for a great speculation. So my answer is really, not only can we, nobody really reliably time markets, <laughs> Very few people have the patience to wait for the perfect timing. So the answer is really not to focus on timing so much as value. Got it. Uh, let's discuss uranium. Uh, what do you think? Where are we in uranium cycle at this moment? And why are uranium stocks not following superb fundamentals <laughs> and everyday inflow, inflow of very good news? Oh, those are two separate questions. Um, and for the uranium cycle, honestly, somebody like Justin Hune from Uranium Investor might be a better person to ask. They understand the, the fuel cycle better than I ever will probably. Um, but as a commodity, yeah. <laughs> as a, as a price or a market cycle, I would say, you know, I think we're still very much in the early stages. The, the, 
the price has been, as I mentioned earlier, uh, rising in a very volatile way, two steps forward, one step back for about five years. Uh, so it's hard to say that, oh, this is the, you know, the early stealth stage of the market. I, I, certainly not within the mining sector. It's not very much of a stealth opportunity. It, it's the awareness is out there. Um, but the cost of the metal is still below the average cost of production. Um, sorry, the, the price of the metal is still below the average cost of production. This is still an industry that, you know, as a, as a whole is a money losing proposition. So you, you, you can't call that a top or anywhere near the top. This is, this clearly on a market level has to be towards the beginning of this cycle. Now, does that mean that if we're at the beginning of the cycle and uranium is at around 54 bucks, that it has to go to 150 or 250 or all these, uh, you know, wonderful dreams that many uranium bugs have? No, not necessarily. But if it just goes from where it is now to 70 bucks plus or minus, that's huge. And not a, not a percentage gain basis, but it's huge for the companies because you go from pretty much everybody not being able to make money in the market to most companies being able to make money. Right now, only the lowest quartile or so can make money in this at these price levels. But you make that transition to plus or minus 70 bucks and suddenly a lot of companies can make can make money and it's a, so it's a it's a objectively the valuation from those companies that go from having no chance to now having a chance you know th that that is a very material change in the value proposition and as far as why the stocks are underperforming it's an interesting time uh and i know that you know, long-suffering uranium bugs hate this. They're pulling their hair out. It's been almost a year now, of uranium going largely sideways. And I'm seeing it in, in social media and my, you know, some of my Twitter uh, followers and so on. People are just so frustrated. They're pulling their hair out, what hair they have left. And, and there's some people that I think are close to capitulation. They're like, they've had it. This is disgusting. This must be manipulation. Yeah. The metal price is up. The stocks don't do anything. I'm I'm out. I actually have only heard like one or two people go that far, but this is the sentiment out there. Um, <laughs> now I don't claim to know the future. I don't claim to be divine, you know, an omniscient or anything, but all of my experience and really all of history tells us that you can't have the price of the metal keep going up and the stocks keep going down. Something's got to give. Either the metal has to come down again or the stocks have to go up. And I see really no reason for the metal to come down. As we were mentioning earlier, the, the end users are finally coming to the table to negotiate new long-term contracts with uranium miners. Uh, you know, this isn't just some theory or, you know, this, this is something that we've been waiting for for years. I've been saying for years that this is the main thing we needed to look for, but now I'm saying it's happening. You know, you can, the companies are reporting it. So this is this is happening. And I think this is very important because you mentioned the fundamentals. The fundamentals for uranium have been very good for a long time, yeah. but that didn't help the price. It's, you know, on the way down to $18 a pound, the fundamentals look good. Even after Fukushima, the fundamentals look good uh, because you know the whole world didn't turn off all their nuclear power plants. They still needed uranium. Um, but that didn't stop the price from going down. So I think like, I don't know how this whole cycle plays out, but I think we're at a very interesting time. And as frustrated as you know, existing uranium bugs are for the those new to the space, I think this is a very exciting time because you know, how many things can you look at that are not cheap anymore, or not you know, scraping the bottom where they were, but you can still buy as though they were. You can buy some of these uranium stocks as cheap or cheaper than they were when uranium was less than $30 a pound. And now it's you know, so I, I see this. As frustrating as it is for those long already, as a terrific opportunity, and I know that you know if you're long already, you're tired of terrific opportunities. You don't want any more terrific opportunities. You want <laughs> yeah. payday. Show me I the money. But, you know, but you know, Mr. Market doesn't care what we want. We just got to take how it is. And either I, I just don't see any market-based reason for uranium and speculators not to get their payday. You know, if if there is a, a another Chernobyl, or if the Russians get crazy and blow up Zaporizhia yeah, yeah. and there's a big nuclear incident, yes, you know that 
could torpedo all of our uranium speculations. I never want to gloss over that. That that is a reality that anybody that steps into this space needs to be aware of. That okay. this this is a speculation that could literally blow up on us. Um, but you know those things are exceedingly rare. And and even Fukushima, it was you know, it wasn't really a nuclear accident. It was a tsunami. Tsunami, yeah. yeah. And and. It was the tsunami that killed people, not the plant, right? You know, and Three Mile Island was really a nothing burger. Really, it's only been Chernobyl that was a, a serious, you know, accident, primarily yeah. nuclear incident. And and there's an argument to be made that even that was really because of Soviet stupidity and secrecy, as opposed to nuclear energy itself. But anyway, it doesn't matter if 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 they blow up Zaporizhia and there's you know radiation spreading across Eastern Europe, if people will react and the stocks will go south so i, I just don't want to pretend that's not so uh, you find uranium stocks undervalued at this moment i do well <laughs> undervalued you know as a value speculator i need to be careful with words like that uh, let's say um a lot of them have a uh, relative undervaluation you know you, you certainly can see a good number of some of the better companies trading closer to their 52 week lows and their 52 week highs. But I, I'm, uh, I'm embarrassing myself a little bit because I, I, I have to backtrack a little, but I mean it in the best way in that you know, many of these companies, what is the value of a company that cannot make money at the current uranium price? Like, see, so you have to believe that the uranium price will go higher and will reach a level at which the company makes sense. Um, there are actually a very few that can make money at these prices. And so it is possible to do and find a, a value proposition in those. But for most of the rest, you have to uh, quote the, the great ph Canadian philosopher Wayne Gretzky and skate to where the puck will be, right? And so I just want to put that out there. I'm, I'm, I'm still wanting to operate on the basis of value, but you have to understand that right now, the value proposition for many of these uranium companies, most of them is zero. They have no value whatsoever. And it doesn't matter how many pounds they have in the ground. If they can't be mined economically right now, right now they have no value. Now we think the price is going to go up, but if it doesn't, you know, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't yeah. help you any, right? So you have to understand the uranium thesis well enough to believe in it enough to say, yes, I'm willing to speculate based on where the puck will be on uranium. If you're not going to do that, if you don't believe that, you, I mean, you just, you need to walk away. You need to go look for something else. Well, unless you're willing to, to go into that small handful of, of very low margin, uh, sorry, very low cost, high margin producers that can make money at current prices. Okay. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about uh, Uranian jurisdictions. So we already discussed uh, the uh, the news from Namibia. Uh, what would you say uh, about Athabasca, about Canada? Uh, the fact that it's uh, from exploration success to production, it can take more than a decade day, dec decade there uh, to 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 uh, things are not uh, done uh, so fast there. Like, like in other jurisdictions, for example, Africa, Niger, Namibia. Uh, yeah, can you expand on that? Uh, sure. <clears throat> uh, I should add quickly, though, that the thing in Namibia, it they haven't actually done it, right? It's a minister yeah, yeah. Has said he's he said that they they should consider this. Yeah. So it hadn't actually happened yet, um, and I, I think you know. It, it could be it could be almost a dead cat bounce opportunity. Now, on the other hand, it's not like this was just some reporter or some nobody there. It was the minister himself who said this. So, I mean, you, you can't just ignore that sort of risk. And there certainly have been plenty of other countries in the <clears throat> developing world that have changed the rules and plenty of other countries in Africa that have just said, no, you know what, you know, we are now mandating this or we're, you know what, we're taking 50 percent, take it or leave it. And, you know, a mine is, you, know, you can't just take your mine and go mine it somewhere else, right? It is where it is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's highly prone to state extortion. And I think it's very important to keep in mind states that might be prone to extortion. 
And so, okay, it takes longer to permit in Canada, or, but at least you can do it. And certainly in the uranium mining jurisdictions, you can do it. Uh, similarly in the US, similarly in Australia. And yes, you'll you'll pay a premium for companies working in those safer jurisdictions. Um, and at some point, you know, the discount in a higher risk jurisdiction is worth it. But you know what? It's not, so, so again, look at the value. Like I'm not gonna pay, you know, $10 billion for a $5 billion deposit just because it's in Canada, right? I, I'll, if it's uh, trading for a billion dollars and I think it's worth 5 billion, well, that's a compelling value proposition and I'm much more comfortable in Canada. Uh, if it's in Namibia and it's a billion dollar deposit trading for a hundred million dollars, 10 cents in the dollar, it's interesting. Five cents on the dollar would be even more compelling, right? Yeah. So, so maybe that's not so bad. I, I'm not one of these people who says that all of Africa is a no-go zone. Um, but when the AK-47s come out, you know, places that have had multiple coups in recent years per year, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, that's that's just too hot. And yes, like in Mali, for example, you can get a mine permitted in six months. That's great. Um, but if your expat team gets shot up on their way to work. That's not so great. And mm -hmm. it's not good for your share price, right? So, you know, if it doesn't happen, you can make a lot of money quickly. I mean, it, I'm I'm certainly not telling everybody that they should never invest in any Mali place. I am saying that if things go bad <laughs> in the way that they can go really bad, you know, you, you can suffer major loss of capital faster than you can hit the bid to sell. Mm -hmm. And that's personally a willing a risk I'm not willing to take. So <laughs> I think I've said, you know, I, I, I wouldn't automatically buy anything in those top three jurisdictions I mentioned, Canada, US, Australia, but I'm much more interested in looking there first. And then there's, never mind the political risk, there's sort of the, the geological factor of the jurisdictions. And it's always interesting to me that Uranium companies will say, we have some of the highest grades in the world outside of the Athabasca Basin. Right, this project in, in Niger or this project in Argentina or Australia. It has some of the highest uranium grades in the world outside of the Athabasca Basin. As, as though that gives them a get out of jail free card. Who cares? If if you have higher grades in Athabasca, why do I care if you have higher grades for non-Athabasca? So, okay, uh, you know, if all the high grade in Athabasca is taken and I need to go look somewhere else, there's not enough uranium, you know, maybe I do that. But it it would take an enormous discount or some other compelling reason for me to consider uh, speculating on something that's not going to have the margin that I get out of an Athabasca play. Like, like why bother? Why, why do I even need to consider low grade in Ebola Central when I've got high grade in Saskatchewan? Got it. Good point. Uh, do you think we could see more M&A activities this year in uranium sector or the next one or the next year? And what, what kind of companies uh, could be involved? Is it the explorers, uh, developers, producers? What do you think? Uh, I think this is actually a very interesting question I've been thinking about recently because I actually think the answer is generally no. I no. think we're less likely to see more M&A specifically in the uranium sector. I think we'll see more in copper and gold and silver and other metals. I expect to see a fair amount of consolidation because that's been delayed uh, really for years by the COVID lockdowns. And, and we're just beginning to see signs of life in the in the takeover sector. Um, takeover is not a sector, in, in takeovers. And I, I think there's interesting opportunity there. But in uranium, you know, how many bigger companies are there to buy? I mean, we might see some mergers between juniors, but that tends to be more of a keep the lights on kind of merger. You know, one, one mm -hmm. company's got a deposit, the other one has a treasury. So why don't we get together? That doesn't excite me. I don't see a lot of value added for, for shareholders in that. I mean, <laughs> sure, I guess it's it can be better if you get uh, you know get a bunch of money without having to issue new stocks. But when you merge the company, you're adding those two stock pools together and it, it can be, you know, dilutive anyway. Um, there, there's no such thing as free money in the mining sector. You're going to have to dilute one way or the other to, to take your exploration project to production. Um, so 
So, you know, I could see more of those kind of mergers, but I, they just wouldn't be exciting. And then, so the top players, you know, is because Adam Prom going to go around buying juniors in in Canada or Australia? Probably not. Even probably if they not. wanted to, those countries probably wouldn't let them. Yeah. Is Cameco going to go around buying more projects around the world? You know, they've got their hands full restarting MacArthur River and, and you know, they have a, a, a pipeline stuffed to the gills with high grade projects and high margin projects of their own that already need, I think they're years from needing to take over anybody else's discovery. They, they've got so much on their plate already. So who else is going to do it? I mean, maybe, or I don't know, I don't know. I mean, there's never say never, it's possible. But my general view is that the, the uh, short list of buyers is probably not going to be doing much shopping anytime soon, specifically in the uranium space. And I'm just not really interested in the mergers between the, the juniors combining. Okay. I have assembled a list of publicly listed uranium and nuclear energy uh, related companies. Uh, it, uh, it's around 121 company of that list. Uh, I, I put it on my website and I will leave the link here so uh, viewers can see it. What do you think? Uh, how many of that... 121 uh, company uh, you can say it's good prospect company and how many of them are pure uh, moose pasture um I, I i'll be a little more generous than that i i don't think it's all or nothing <laughs> okay but it's more like i think that by far the vast majority 90 percent more or less they're not going to make it this cycle Right. I mean, if if the demand for uranium continues growing the way we uranium bulls think it will, I mean, China's building scores of these things. BRICS countries at large are building even more. And Eastern Europe, they can't they can't get in here fast enough. They're, and they're dragging the rest of Europe back towards nuclear. Um, and even the United States, even the Biden administration isn't just talking about it. They're pushing for money to advance to push advanced nuclear. So. This is clearly an idea whose time has come. This is very bullish for demand. And going forward, I think that will be good news for a lot of projects that I probably wouldn't even touch today. But there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that's been waiting for the for the next upturn, right? And I, I think those, um, those are the projects that have a chance to really deliver for shareholders this cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's get to gold. Uh, gold price recently touched all-time highs. Uh, how do you see price of gold performing performing for the remainder of the year? And what is your crystal ball telling you about interest <laughs> rates getting for the remainder of the year? And are we going to see a recession? Okay, so I have no crystal ball, but I'm highly confident that we are in a mask recession already. The main reason that people say that we're not in a recession is because of the strong labor market and the strong consumer, therefore, uh, that's lagging. I think that the labor hoarding that was done after the COVID lockdowns, when it was so hard to hire people, has caused companies to not lay off as they should in a market downturn. Uh, and that actually exacerbates the problem because if you hold on to more labor than you need because you're afraid that you won't be able to get them back that means you bear a higher cost than you should and you know you might have been able to let go 10 or 20 percent of your workforce and, and survive but if you hold on to them and bankrupt yourself you end up letting go of 100 percent. so it, it can make the problem much worse yeah um i don't know the future i don't know what's going to happen but this is my outlook i i think things are you know because except for these these two related bright spots, pretty much everything else is negative. Leading economic index, inverted yield curve, like insanely inverted levels. Um, you, you Almost all the rest of the data is very bearish. Um, and so my, my view is that we likely are in a recession that will become undeniable um, over the course of this summer or by the end of this year at latest. And this is pretty unusual for me. You know, I usually like to say, well, let's just see how it goes. Yeah. Um, but I just I I just don't see any other, other out for this. So I feel quite strongly about this, and I'm putting my own money where my mouth is on that. 
in that environment, you know, the, the bad news is I think we're going through the ringer. The good news is I think that'll be very good for monetary metals. I think the response from the powers that be will be to pivot to easy money, lickety split. You know, the, the Fed has done a good job convincing investors that, you know, no rate cuts, not this year, you know, maybe not, next, you know, like they've really been able to push those odds out. The market odds now on Fed rate cuts this year have all but disappeared, whereas that was the majority view not so long ago. Um, you know, behold the power of the jawbone of, of Powell and the other Fed speak, uh, talking heads. But I, it's not, you know, that assumes that things go, you know, the way they're thinking that'll go, disinflation, blah, blah, blah. But that that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the Fed's going to cut because they beat inflation and it's time to go again. No, I'm saying that the Fed has already broken something. What they're doing is going to break more somethings. The economy is going to hurt and they're going to be, they, Powell himself has said that systemic risk would be a reason for him to pivot. Though he didn't use the pivot word, but that would be a reason for them to change course. I think they will see systemic risk before the end of this year. And I think that they will pivot. And I think that will be very good for gold and silver. I can't give you odds. I can't say what the percentage is, okay. but that's my base case outlook. And so, yes, I think we see new nominal all-time highs in gold. Again, you know, higher than the 2085. I mean, if you think about that, you know, but 21, 2200 is really not much of a stretch, you know, uh, to, to go. And, and if that really lights the fire of excitement in people, and particularly if inflation proves stickier than they think, and the latest PCE numbers are telling us that inflation is stickier than they fed on. Uh, you could have that 70s scenario where you have, you know, recession, stagflation, high inflation, and people start expecting higher inflation. And then, you know, that really lights a fire under gold. Now, this is could. This is uh, this is if not when, right? Yeah. I don't know that this will happen. I'm saying that if it does play out this way, you know, it's easy to imagine gold going up, you know, well over 2,500, maybe even a new real all-time high over the year ahead. Um, but I, I think it, the it, worst case scenario is that this environment is very supportive for gold. I don't see gold going significantly lower. I think in the very nearest term, however, there are headwinds for gold. Uh, real rates in the US have turned positive. That's not good. Nominal rates are increasing. Market rates are increasing. Whatever the Fed does, that's not good. Um, the dollar had been favorable as in going down earlier this year, but now it looks like inflation is cooling in Europe and um, this whole thing with the debt ceiling and the refilling of the treasury's general account is you know, bullish for the dollar. So we've seen multiple headwinds for the very near term for gold. So when I talk about, oh, I think gold will hit a new all-time nominal high before the end of this year, I'm not promising that it's going up tomorrow. In fact, you know, gold bugs don't like hearing this, but I actually think that there's a pretty good chance we'll see more weakness in gold in the immediate future, like mm -hmm. as in this coming week and the weeks ahead, immediately ahead. There's there's significant headwinds for gold right now. Um, but then I think, you know, the whole debt ceiling thing gets ironed out. It's it's one of these, you know, big fluctuations that as soon as it's settled, it works its way through. And then we get back to the overall economic outlook, which I, which I think is bearish economy, therefore yeah. bearish dollar, therefore bullish alternatives, including gold and yes, silver. Uh, we touched on the recession a few moments ago. How do you think silver would perform in a recession environment? Yeah, this is where my, my uh, friends over at Wall Street Silver like calling me Darth Silver because... Yeah. I like him. Yeah, you know, it's not that I like it. It's not like I get off on beating up on silver. And I am very bullish on silver. It it remains a monetary metal. You can still see it, you know, responding to monetary phenomenon as gold does most of the time. Um, but it is also abundantly clear that silver's industrial aspect has become much more uh, potent in the marketplace. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, more demand for silver can't really hurt. But it does mean that when the economy turns south, you know, the industrial buyers are, you know, are going to step back. 
And I think this is, I think this is part of why we saw, let me put it this way. Every time we've had a metal, a, a, a monetary metals bull cycle since 1971, silver has lagged gold and then more than caught up on a percentage gain basis. Every one of these bull markets, silver actually outperformed gold at, by the time it got to its peak. And this is one reason why we love silver so much. It's more volatile. It makes sense. A more volatile metal should outperform the less volatile metal by the top of the cycle. And that's been true every single time since 1971, except in 2020. Silver never caught up with gold on a percentage gain basis. <laughs> it, it got whacked harder. It did not come back. It, it took a year longer than gold or really to start to even recover. It just, I mean, it, it was like the little old lady in the commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think we can't be religious about our favorite metals or whatever. We have to look at what the market is doing and you can get mad and, and blame Darth Silver or blame those evil manipulators, but, but that doesn't help you make money in the market. And I, I think the reality is right now that the industrial aspect of silver is going to make it likely underperform gold this year. And then, you know, when we get to that mania phase, when things are really pulling that hockey stick on the chart, um, I, th I think probably silver will still at the end of the day outperform gold. Like I say, we have this one counter example, but if you look at all the other ones, the odds actually still favor silver outperforming gold at the end of the days. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but I just, I just think it's worth emphasizing to the rational silver speculator out there. And I'm not talking about your stacking your bullion at home. I'm talking about betting on silver stocks when you speculate. I, I think. Okay, it, but it do you personally like to be physical careful. silver and hold it? Well, the the thing there is, yeah, I I have more physical silver by volume than gold, mm -hmm. but not by value. Of course, uh, because it's bulkier. Of course, so uh, you know people you know, they like to show pictures of themselves swimming in their silver coins on their bed and on YouTube and stuff. And <laughs> I hope their address isn't out there, you know. But <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know. It, it looks fun. It sounds cool, but 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 why? If if you're buying more silver because you think the price is going to go up more, or the silver dollar exchange rate is going to go up more, that's not a reason to take physical. You know, if I'm betting on a price movement, well, I'll probably buy an ETF, and then it's easier to get in and out. It's much cheaper. You don't have to pay the premium for taking delivery. People are paying like twice the the value of the coin to take delivery on a premium coin now. That's insane. The price has to double for them even just to break even on a value basis. Yeah. Um, so so no, I mean if I if if I want to if I want to store savings, wealth for the long term, then it's primarily in gold. And I have a bit of silver to make change in case of a Mad Max scenario. And if I actually, you know, had to spend some and I didn't want to go to the store to buy a loaf of bread with an ounce of gold <laughs> or, or even a 10th of an ounce, right? I, I break out the silver. So, so yes, it's good to have silver, but for long-term storage, gold is simply much more convenient. If only because it doesn't tarnish and it's so much smaller, more compact uh, for, for, and then if you're going to bet on the price movements, well, then there's no need to take physical delivery on that. That, you know, it's much more convenient and cheaper to use a proxy. I agree. Uh, Lobo, what well, then you're going to start getting hate mail along with Darth Silver. No, 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 <laughs> no. No worry. Uh, what assets would you advise investors to avoid at this moment? Boy, well, I'm not a, I'm not a macro guru, so I'm not sure I can really say a whole lot. Uh, clearly, uh, commercial real estate seems pretty problematic. I think even housing right now. Um, you know, is is problematic. You know, it's it's one thing to buy a, a holiday home that you would actually use and you might Airbnb when you're not there or whatever and have some investment upside in. But if you're buying a, a holiday home in, in split in Croatia because it's so beautiful yeah. uh, and you want to go there in the summer, you know, that's one thing. But if you're going to buy up Croatian beachfront real estate because you think the price is going to go up and the world goes into a deep recession, you know, that could be a very bad move for a number of years. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I, I'm, 
thinking macro here, you know, just just have some common sense about what recessions are likely to do. Back in my own wheelhouse for metals and mining or or minerals, um, I'm on the record that I'm not buying any industrial minerals. I'm I'm very bullish on copper. We haven't talked about copper, but I think that's a multi-decade bull, you know, structural supply constraints that just can't be alleviated. Um easily and, and not without much higher prices. And even then it's going to take a change of heart in governments to permit some of these big projects that have to be permitted or there's just not going to be enough copper. So I'm extremely bullish on that, but not till after the recession. <laughs> like, you know, it, it, there's nothing that is immune to that recession and certainly not industrial metals. And people think, oh, well, it's already cheaper. It's gone back under four bucks. It's gone down to 360 something last I saw. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. You know, it, it, people still haven't given up denying the recession. So I think th there are a lot of traders out there who who will dump copper and zinc and you know all this other stuff big time when that recession becomes undeniable. And I think uh, similarly for oil, I'm uh, natural gas is trickier. It's more regional markets and it's it's not so simple, not as fungible as oil. Um, but oil. It's kind of like copper in a way that the a little bit different in that it's there's oil out there, but the industry's been starved of capital. The whole politically correct crowd, the ESG mandates and so on, are are making it harder and harder to explore and develop for oil. You know, you know when Biden says, "Oh, we'll need oil for at least ten more years," like he he was genuinely surprised when he got laughed at for saying that. Like you know, these people just don't get it. You don't build, you know, a forty billion dollar refinery to run it for ten years. So, I'm very bullish on oil in the same way I'm bullish on copper. Um, a somewhat more political dynamic there, but I wouldn't buy any oil stocks going into the recession either because energy, you know, the whole energy sector gets whacked. The only exception, I mean, right now until the recession hits, I'm buying gold, silver, and uranium. And the reason why I'm willing to go there on uranium is because unlike oil, I mean, it's it's not an industry in liquidation for oil and people are not forced to contract at higher prices for oil. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, Russia is doing everything it can to sell its oil. You know, it, it has to take cheaper prices through India or whatever to get its oil out there to fund its war. So it, it it's different. Uranium, if if you're a utility and you want to secure a supply, not just buy off the spot market what little is left, but you want secure supply for your power plants for the next X years to come, you have got to sit down with a miner and negotiate a long-term contract. And they're just not going to sign that at prices that make no sense for them. So that's why I think, it, I, I wouldn't call anything recession-proof. They're certainly not stock market crash-proof. Um, but I'm very bullish on uranium, not just someday, but this year, despite the recession. Everything else, except for gold and silver, I would wait till after the recession. Okay. But uh, one final question. Uh, are you more bullish on uranium or on copper? Well, it would depend on the time frame. Um, no, I mean generally. Uh, well, generally, I guess I would say copper. Because... Uh -huh. I think copper, those structural supply constraints I talked about, those are those may be solved by higher prices, but that's not a that's that's an if, not a when question. Like there, there literally is not enough copper. You have to build something like an Escondido, the largest copper mine in the world. Like you have to build one of those every year for the next 20 years. I mean, yeah. it's just not happening, right? It's just not there. And or, or if it is, if you go to the, some of these known large low-grade copper land bank plays. Uh, you know, high enough prices will bring those online, but you still got to permit them, right? Uh, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah. that's a that's a big deal. Whereas uranium is not rare; it's a byproduct. You know, at the right price, it's a byproduct, not just from IOCG, uh, iron, iron oxide, copper, gold, like Olympic Dam. Um, it's also a byproduct from gypsum mines, from air earth mines. It's a you know, there's a vanadium. Uranium is a common byproduct from vanadium. Yeah. So there's a lot of uranium out there. So uh, you know, uranium doesn't have to go to $300 to supply the market. It doesn't have to go to $100 to supply the market. I think if it just goes to 70, 80 bucks and stays there, I think high prices will cure high prices pretty quickly. And I don't think uranium would tank them. It has to stay there. Like the industry's cost levels are such 
that it has to stay at a level that will satisfy the miners. And that level is higher than today. So I'm, I like uranium. I see that as a very high probability, but I don't think it necessarily goes, you know, vertical the way it did in 2007. So, I, you know, on that basis, I guess I like copper better. But mm -hmm. today I like uranium better because I think it's happening now, whereas copper probably not till after the recession. Good answer. Uh, how can investors reach out to you and became uh, and become a subscriber of your services? Well, there's obviously I, I'd love people to hire me to be their due diligence guy through one of my paid services. But my recommendation is usually just to start with our free service. We have a weekly newsletter called the Speculators Digest. And if you sign up for that, we promise, I promise, we will not spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. You right. get one email per week. We, we might put out a survey once a year or something. But you get one email per week. Uh, and sure, there will be links to my paid services in there. But each edition has my latest thoughts, my analysis of markets and what's affecting our resource investments. And I try sincerely to put as much value as I can in that on the markets. And when it comes to the companies, due diligence is what I do for my paid clients. Okay. Lobo, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to talk with you and I wish you good luck with your uh, business as well as your private life. Thank you, Lucien. And you too for your new channel here. I wish you great success with it. Thank you very much.